All right, looks like it's time to start. If I can get people to stop fellowshipping. Well, not people. My mom. Oh, wait, now it's Sandy. And now it's Sharon. Boy. That was the favorite story I got from one of my many parent-teacher conferences that my parents had to attend when I was in school. And we had one teacher, I think it was fourth grade, was meeting with my parents, and she said, Mike's a very good student. He's a pleasure to have in class. How do you get him to stop talking? And my dad looked at her and said, you don't. <laughs> And he was right. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, and they, they would do the, they would sit me next to the teacher's desk, so I, I'd talk to the teacher. Yeah. And, and give very positive and helpful feedback. Critique methods. Point out when they'd done their mathematics wrong. You know, all that kind of good stuff. So I understand people that talk too much. I was never that, that hard on kids that enjoyed talking. The ones that confuse me are the ones that sit in class and do this. And you'll say, are you okay this morning? Yes. Because my girls were never like that. If you asked a question, you'd be ready for a paragraph and a half. So... Okay, well, I think we're all ready to start now. We're going to have a good time tonight. This is Bible study at Bethel on Wednesday night, and it's the middle of the week, and we get to be encouraged and informed and educated by our founding pastor, Ron Halverson. So please welcome him. Well, good evening, everybody, and I'm glad you're here. You know, I've, I've, I've noticed um, those stairs have only been there since 1980. But for some reason, they're getting harder to get up every every time I come to the platform. And they don't change at all. But anyway, we got up and we're doing fine. Just, um, uh, just because people are curious, uh, let, let me just take a few minutes to let you know that I'm doing okay. Uh, I have a, every week, every Sunday especially that I'm here, people say, well, how are you doing? And I'm reading between the lines. What they're saying is, since Pastor Annie went to heaven, how are you doing? And it's been, uh, well, this month, two and a half years. And the nerve of that woman <laughs> leaving me for another man, <laughs> a much better man. I don't blame her. But uh, really, I, I'm doing well. Uh, I have uh, a nice little uh, condo that uh, since I, I decided I didn't need a, a living room because it's just me. And if, if somebody comes to uh, visit me, they can sit in a chair. Uh, so I put a desk right in the middle of the living room. And that's where I 
have my office. And it uh, works out real good. I have a nice big window that I look straight out out onto the street and I watch all the neighbors as they're going by and I haven't figured out who they are but um, uh, they go by walking their dogs and various uh, things so it, it, it works good. I get a lot of study time. I'm still working uh, in ICFM, International Convention of Faith Ministries, uh, a group of ministers running over 300 nationwide. And we have um, also groups in 14 different nations now. So I'm, I'm enjoying that work. I'm doing my best to stay busy. Um, the days are shorter when you stay busy. Uh, they don't drag out. So uh, I'm really doing just fine. I have those that call me quite often, just checking in on me. Uh, one is Sito uh, and Lucy Rael. Sito uh, calls me every now and then. In fact, when I talked to him on um, Monday, he, he said, you know, you, you need to come and spend a couple days with us in Denver. And I said, well, that would be a lot of fun. I would enjoy that. He said, but I'm, I'm only going to come in January or February so that I can stand in the window while you're out shoveling snow off of your driveway. And um, he said, no, don't come at that time of the year. So, but anyway, uh, I appreciate uh, everybody checking up on me to make sure I'm okay. Just don't ask my girls if I'm okay. They they check on me every day or every other day. They sort of alternate and uh, make sure that I'm doing all right. So I am doing fine. And thank you, everybody, for being concerned for me and for loving me because I love you and I always will. It, uh, it's just something that we're a part of each other and it doesn't go away. Now, Todd, I want you to hand out some notes. I have a, really, it's a very short message tonight. Um, one that I hope you will enjoy. We're going to be talking out of Matthew chapter number six and our context is verses 24 to 34. If you want to write that down any place, that's, that's great. Um, it's a area in the scriptures that most of you know uh, uh, from your years of being Christians and what have you. But um, uh, I, I don't know that I have ever preached a more serious message than what I'm about to deliver to you tonight. And again, there, there's so much to it that I've given you a, a full set of notes so that you could follow along. And if it looks like I'm reading my notes, it's because I am. And uh, that way we can go through this and I'm going to be slow. I'm going to be delib deliberate. Del yes, deliberate. I'll get that word out. And 
I, I want you to think through everything I say in, in the sentences. It's, it's only three pages long, so we won't be here all night long. Now, in Matthew 20, uh, chapter 6, verse 25, we have these words, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. Everybody say life. Boy, that's a big word, isn't it? Take no thought for your life. I'll tell you what I do every morning. As I wake up, I say, oh, I'm still here. Well, yeah, anybody as old as you are probably would do that. But I'll, I'll tell you what, it's, and as you're going to see in a little bit, I'm, I'm doing my best to live one day at a time. And if you'd start doing that, it will help you every day. So I get up and say, well, I'm still here. Thank you, Lord, for one more day. And that's my, my goal, is to do it one day at a time. Now look a couple verses down, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. Therefore, take no thought saying. And we're going to cover what the saying is in just a little bit. But the point is, in these two verses, it says, take no thought. Now, in verse 34 of Matthew uh, chapter 6, it says, take, therefore, no thought for the morrow. Take no thought for tomorrow. Now, that's... That's the whole point of my message is, is wrapped up in those three statements. Let's look at the introduction here. The word thought in these three verses means anxious. So take no anxiousness for your life. Take no Anxiousness saying this or that. Take therefore no anxiousness about what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay, I hope you're starting to get a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about tonight. Now the word anxious means to choke in fear. Oh my goodness. Choke in fear. Do, do you know in our day and age, we say about each other, well, I was just having an anxiety attack. What were you doing? You're choking in fear. Now, another word for that is the word worry. You're not to worry because when you worry, you are choking yourself in fear. Now, the title of my message tonight is Stop It! And I'm serious. Look at number three. Doctors still tell us that 50% of the people in hospitals are suffering from physical disorders caused by worry or anxiety. Now the question is, do you want to go to the hospital? If you do, keep worrying. 
you'll end up there. I guarantee you, according to God's word, if you continue to worry, you're headed for a hospital bed. It will be other diseases and situations that will come in, but it's the worry that puts you there and has brought these other diseases upon you. Look at number four. The Lord is saying through Matthew, stop it. You say, stop what? Eliminate worry from your life. And you'll live a lot longer. And you'll live in health. So stop it. And you don't see me smiling. Look at number five. You say, oh yeah? How do you do that? That's easier said than done. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. And I'm going to give you seven steps out of worry. Seven steps to control your mind, your, your soul man, because there's where the problem is. It's not in your spirit man. It's in your soul. It's in your mind, your will, your emotions. And what the Lord is saying, stop it. Now, this short message tonight could save your life. You think I'm kidding. And again, you don't see me smiling. It, it uh, I, I don't even know that even through the rest of this, that uh, I'm going to be able to express it fully in just a short time. This is a huge subject. But these steps are going to help you to catch yourself when you find yourself worrying. Are you still here? Okay, look at the person next to you, make sure they're awake. Uh, I, I, I want them to be sure and hear these seven steps. Step number one, you must be in the family of God. You must be. If you want to know how to get out of worry, number one, you must be in the family of God. Verse 26 and verse 32 talks about this. These two, in these two verses, this whole subject is addressed to the children of God the Father. And if you're not in the family of God, you don't have God as your father. But you can go through these seven steps then if you take the first one. But if you don't take the first one, you're, you're not going to get there. It's really that simple. Now, verse 26 says, Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Now the them is talking about the birds. The Lord is so interested in the birds. But he's a lot more interested in you, his children. Many of you have animals at home. But they don't take the place of your children. They don't have priority over your children. 
Your children are your beloved. I mean, you women that have had children, man, what a thing you went through. If it was one or 25, it was a chore to give birth to that child. And you love that child. Even when they do wrong, you love them. You'll always love them. And your heavenly Father loves you in the very same way. Verse 32 says, Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. He already knows. And he's watching over you. He's loving you. He's caring for you. Now, listen to this, letter B. There is no real solution to the worry problem if you are not a Christian. Think about it a moment. There's no real solution over the worry problem that puts 50% of the people in the hospital in the hospital. There's nothing you can do if you worry and worry and worry. You don't have a heavenly father watching over you if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And that's letter C. If you want to be free from worry, the first step is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior. We find that in John 3, 3. We find that in Ephesians 3, verses 14 and 15. And that list could go on and on and on. Don't forget this next sentence. The next sentence is, the world's only solution is expensive drugs that have all kinds of negative side effects. But the worry is still there. It's only covered up. It's not taken away. It's still upon you as long as you take the drugs that they give you. And those drugs with all their side effects are harder to come uh, combat than the problem itself. So the problem, first of all, is you got to be in the family of God. And if you're not, you're going to struggle with worry the rest of your life. Have you ever had anybody call you up and say, well, how you doing? I've just been worried about you. Well, stop it. Get in the family of God so you can pull this thing down. Get rid of it. You've got to get rid of that worry. Now, you, you think I'm standing here being real spiritual, don't you? When Pastor Annie passed away, in May of 2019. By the latter part of June, I went into grief. And I mean, it was heavy. It, I, I, I struggled. I would moan right out loud all day long. I, I would, uh, couldn't sleep. I, I just really struggled with grief. And what happened to me is I went to 
Fort Worth, Texas in July and to the Kenneth Copeland Convention in Fort Worth. And I went there and I was saying, Lord, let's, let Kenneth Copeland prophesy to me. Oh, you've never done that when you were there, were you, have you? Uh, you know, I just was so eager to get out of this grief. And interestingly enough, because I have a friend who's one of the ushers for the Copeland Conventions, he put me on the front row. And so the first service, Kenneth Copeland comes out. This is at nine o'clock in the morning and he greets everybody and he says, now, before I preach, I have to tell you this about grief. And I'm going, oh, no wonder I'm here. And he talked about grief for about 10 minutes. And then he came back to the pulpit and preached his message. Do you know I don't remember anything about what he said except one thing. And he said, if you have grief, only you can stop it. God is not going to take it away from you until you make up your mind to stop grieving. You can grieve the rest of your life if you want to. That'll just put you in the hospital again. And I'm meditating on those words. He preached his sermon. I don't have the foggiest idea of what he said in his sermon. Those words were implanted in my mind and in my spirit man to the place where I, I thought, oh man, I, I, I'm going to have to get out of here. And the Spirit of God said, sit still. The next speaker came up and uh, he starts to preach and he stopped. And he said, now Brother Copeland just talked to us a little bit about grief and I have to talk to you about it as well. And he talked about 15 minutes and in it he said, when you make up your mind, you'll come out of grief. But you have to stop it. Nobody can stop it for you. Well, then he preached his sermon. And again, whatever he said in that sermon must have been good. But I got the idea God was talking to me. Well, it came time for, for lunch. And the hotel where I was staying was right across the street from the convention center. And I walked across the street and I, I said to uh, my good friends, Phil and Darlene Driscoll, who was with me, uh, I said, you guys go to lunch. I'm, I'm going to my room. I've, I've got to pray. And I got into my room and I stood there and said, what do I do now? See, what I didn't realize is that grief is a part of fear. I didn't realize that grief was a part of worry. I didn't realize that grief was a part of anxiety. And I said, Lord, what do I do? And the Lord said, stop it. It's up to you. When do you want out of it? 
I said, I want out of this thing right now in the name of Jesus, and I proclaim that grief leaves me, and do you know I felt it go right up through my head and right out through the roof of that building. But I had to get to the place where I didn't want that grief anymore. I was, it, it was painful. Grief is a terrible thing. And anybody that has grief, I understand. I was there for over a month. That shows you how spiritual I was. But I'm thankful that God showed me. Now, not everybody is going to have the preacher stop and do that. And I'm certain in those several thousands that were there that there was more than just me there. But those two messages were for me. Just like this message is for you tonight. If you're a chronic worrier, you can come out of it, but you've got to make up your mind. I'm not going to have it anymore in the name of Jesus. Let's go on to step number two. Remind yourself that you have a loving Heavenly Father and that you are very precious to him. And again, verses 26 and 32, your heavenly Father loves even the birds of the air. So how much more does he love and care for us, his children? You've got to get that picture that you are a child of God. It's vital, vital, vital. And letter C says, worry is absolutely unnecessary. You don't have to worry. Worry doesn't show your love. Well, if, if I don't worry about them, it will show that I don't care. No, worry does not show love. It's not necessary for you to do it. Let's go to page two. Letter D is, but you have to take this step. You have to remind yourself every day of your life, if necessary. You have to remind yourself that you have this heavenly Father who loves you, you are precious to him. But you have to do it. You have to stop it. Nobody can stop it for you. Nobody can come to Pastor Mike and say, Pastor Mike, please, please pray that this worry will leave me. No, it's up to you. It's not up to him. It's not up to God. It's up to you to make up your mind. And you need to say, God, I know that you love me, you're concerned about me, and you're the one who has said, don't worry. So again, stop it. Let's look at step number three. Recognize that worry is completely unprofitable and unrewarding. There's no reward for your wor worry. That worrying doesn't make you a better person. Worry will just absolutely destroy you. Look at verse 32 with me. Which of you, by taking thought or worry, which of you, by taking worry, can add one cubit unto his stature? Now, that word cubit 
is a measurable thing. And in this particular thing, well, by the way, when, when Noah was building his ark, it was so many cubits. Well, the cubit was from fingertip to elbow. So everybody's cubit was different. So whose measurement they used for sure, don't know. But in this word, this word cubit is talking about one centimeter. That's one one hundredth of an inch. Who by worrying can add one one hundredth to your height? Not even Becky can do that. Becky of what? Four foot eleven? Oh, four foot eleven and three quarters, she wants you to know. But she can't add that other quarter inch. It will never come, especially not by worry. So, so what if you're short? If you're short, be happy that when you stand up, your feet reach the floor just like everybody else. I'll give you a little time to think that one through. My mother was four foot ten, four foot eleven. But my mother could still reach the earlobe of us kids no matter how tall we got. And she had a vice grip between her thumb and her finger, and wherever that ear went, we went with it. Now, worry is not going to help you one bit. There's nothing that you can gain by worrying. Am, am I talking to you? Are, are you... Are you getting the idea? Look at letter B. Is worrying about it going to make you grow? No. Worry is a complete waste of time and energy. Worry is destructive to your health. And again, it'll put you in the hospital. You must take this step and stop it. I'm giving you time to think about it. I, I, I want you to chastise yourself a little bit. I want you to understand God does not want you to worry. But you're the only one who can stop it. Look at step number four. Recognize that to worry is unchristian. I don't know if that's a word or not, but it is now. Unchristian, verse 22. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Well, you think, well, I'm a Gentile. Well, so am I in that sense. But letter A, the word Gentiles here means non-Christian. Who have no heavenly father watching over them as we do. So after all this thing, these things that you're worried about, all this worry that you have going on, it, it's non-Christian. Let her be how wrong it is then for we Christians 
his children to worry. It's unchristian. It's wrong. It's wrong for you to do that. It's worse than most things that I can think of. Let her see we must take the step to recognize that worry is unchristian. And do you know what else that means? That means that those that don't have a heavenly father are acting just like their father, the devil. And anybody that you see worrying now that you have become so spiritual tonight, just know they're acting like their father, the devil. It's unchristian to worry. So let that ring in your brain for a while. Let that just go through you and cause you to say, to say hey, I've, I've got to quit this worrying. This has got to stop. I've got to put an end to it. And I just say to you, stop it. Let's go to step number five. Put your faith into action is what verse 30 tells us to do. Jesus said, O ye of little faith. I want you to understand, Jesus was talking. And Jesus gives a rebuke to Christians who worry. And Jesus is the one saying it here. Now, that's a big ouch. Because every time you go to worry, recognize that you're about to get a rebuke from Jesus saying to you, O oh, ye of little faith. Now that, that word rebuke means a scolding. It means even heavier than that, a tongue lashing. It, it, it is just the opposite of the word praise. The Lord doesn't praise you because you're worrying. It's just the opposite. It's a rebuke from Jesus to be in that category of little faith. You're to have great faith. You're to have a faith that never quits. Look um, at letter B. When you find yourself worrying, you must put your faith to work immediately. And remember, nobody can do that for you. It's your faith. You've got to put your faith. No one can stop it for you. You are the one who has to do it. Your faith must go into action. And about the first way of doing that is to eliminate certain words from your vocabulary. Eliminate the word worry from your vocabulary. And when you hear yourself saying it, slap yourself. Don't knock your glasses off like I just about did. You, you see why I said tonight this message may save your life if you'll do it. You've got to put your words of your mouth together in faith. Letter E. You've got to get into 
faith action. Don't be a Christian of little faith. But again, you have to do it. You have to stop it. Because if you don't stop worrying, it'll never happen. Because God is not going to take worry out of you because he put that in your power using his word to come out of it just like I did when I was in grief over my wife passing. You're still here? Step number six, live one day at a time. Verse 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow or for tomorrow. Jesus is simply saying, trust God one day at a time. Well, pastor, I just don't have enough money and I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, did you know that things can change in a hurry? And by tomorrow, it could change totally. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And you'll take care of tomorrow by not worrying tomorrow and not worrying the next day. But one day at a time, handle this worry situation. Let's look at step number seven. Make sure you are putting the Lord Jesus first in your life. Verse 33, and I think it's exciting to see where this verse fits. The context of this verse is to stop worrying. Listen, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things that you are worried about are going to be added unto you as you get out of worry. You can't get to where you want to be if you're worried sick. Oh, you've heard that term, haven't you? Worried sick. We say it so easily. But this is a simple truth of these verses. If Christ is really first in your life, you have nothing to worry about. Jesus is your all-sufficient one. He's taking care of you. If you know it or not, he is. So stop worrying by following these seven steps. And remember, nobody can do it for you. You have to stop it. So look at your neighbor and say, stop it. Pastor Mike. Now, see, I'm sitting there on the front row worrying about how you guys are going to take this message. <laughs> no. <laughs> One of my favorite things is looking at some of the expectations that we as church people have. And we're told constantly about the authority that we have in our position as God's children. But so many of us don't understand that there is no authority without corresponding responsibility. And there is no responsibility without corresponding authority. 
God never holds you responsible for something you don't have the authority to deal with. So on Sundays, we've been reading about how the fight is the Lord's. He never holds us responsible for that. But if we want to operate in the authority that we have as children of God, we've got to take responsibility for what we do. <laughs> it's up to us not to worry. And I'm going to watch, especially the people that I work with, and I'm going to watch as we're walking somewhere by ourselves and all of a sudden someone goes, And I'll say, ah, Sandy was trying to worry about something, but she just stopped herself. And Margie's going to be marching around campus, and she's going to look at Mandy, and she's going to slap Mandy. And then we'll have to say, now Margie, Pastor didn't say slap the person next to you. <laughs> but it is, it's up to us. And I love the fact that worry does not make you a better person. It makes you a sadder, unhealthier person because we have a good father and he takes good care of his kids and I'm still learning to trust him. But every day he proves himself trustworthy. So that was very, very good. Thank you, Pastor, for, for blessing us with that. So now we're wrapping up the service. It's the time when we talk about giving because it is our privilege to give to support the work that God is doing here. And if you're a part of Bethel, it's your privilege to give to support what Bethel's doing. And we've got several ways you can give. Todd's got offering envelopes. If you're in the room and you've got cash and you want to do it that way, I actually used some cash this morning because we were having an activity out on the playground where our students in our school got to duct tape the principal to a basketball pole. And it was a fundraiser, because you could buy one wrap of tape for a dollar. And I was out there watching the first grade classes tape Mr. Panky to the basketball pole, which meant that all the tape was from here down and I thought they needed some help. So I dug it into my pocket and I pulled out about 10 bucks. And I looked at Mr. Panky and I said, you better raise your arms. <laughs> and I wrapped him up. But I used cash, they didn't have an ATM reader out there. And I couldn't just use my phone. So, but have you ever noticed how you start to worry whenever someone comes up to take an offering? Well, but, but if I give money in the offering, I might not be able to afford my $8 coffee at Starbucks tomorrow. Or, or what was it Angela got last week? Hot white chocolate sugar cookie something. And she takes a sip of this stuff and she goes, Dad, this is a life-changing experience. And she came and she was handing it out. And, and she's telling me that she's handing it around to everybody. And I said, you realize that that's going to be a super spreader event. <laughs> and then we all laughed. Because what is it that everybody worries about? Oh my gosh, they coughed. Because God is an all-powerful God unless someone coughs. We do this all the time, and we've got to stop it, and it's up to us. That's so good. So it's our privilege to give. The Bible says God will bless us when we give. He always has. He always will, and he never, ever tells us to give something that's going to hurt us. He only tells us to give what he knows we should. So that, that's what we're doing right now. You can give on the app, you can give on the website, you can give in the envelope to Todd. You can, anything you want. The important part is supporting what God is doing in your church family. And, and I love how generous my church family is. So having said all that, we'll close in prayer and we'll get out of here tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for giving us such a wonderful, 
which is a productive day and showing us in many ways how wonderful you are and what a good father you are. And Father, reminding us that we can trust you. You have got it. We don't need to worry about it. So Father, as we're reminding ourselves of that and we are stopping what we do that makes us worry, thank you for loving us, thank you for protecting us, and thank you for bringing us back safely on Sunday. We pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Have a great evening, everybody.